All right, thank you, Barry, for the introduction. And I'd like to thank Ra for raising the bar. Thanks a lot for the rest of us. And Anat for those creative messaging tools that we all need to address inequality. I wish I would have heard her before my speech, but. So why am I here as part of this panel? The whole point of what I want to talk to you about today is the power of collective action and how it can counter the rise in inequality and how unions fit into that picture. Now, when I think about inequality, especially as of late, I think about those teachers in Wisconsin, construction workers in Ohio, nurses in New Hampshire, who have been locked out and denied their basic rights to collective bargaining. We've seen what that looks like in the state capitol in Wisconsin, and we worked with our friends at Laughing Liberally to show you now what's happening in office buildings all across this country. Here's to America's workers. When the economy was down, they sacrificed. During tough times when executive bonuses soared, workers' pay stalled and they lost benefits. But it was for the good of the company to keep profits high, to keep the economy going. But now, business is back. CEO pay and company profits are hitting new highs. It's time for America's workers to share in the prosperity. Give us your tired cubicle worker, your weary factory worker, your exhausted teacher. Give us your shoulder aches, your carpal tunnel, your bunions, because this is the negotiating table. It's your time, American worker, and the negotiating table will welcome you. The negotiating table is there for you to, uh, well, uh, maybe it's not, uh, well, the negotiating table isn't really available to you just yet. Uh, Without collective bargaining, workers don't have a voice at the table. Uh, I really didn't see that coming, no. Yeah, so thank, thanks to the folks at Laughing Liberally. And without collective bargaining, workers are locked out. They don't have a voice at the table. And that's what this was all about. The Wisconsin Uprising. The Wisconsin Uprising was about people defending their rights to join together and be represented at the bargaining table, to have a say in their future. Now, Scott Walker, John Kasich and other Republican politicians in dozens of states have gone all out to silence workers' voices. And after being in Wisconsin, I can't actually mention Scott Walker's name without thinking of this photo. Anybody seen this one? Wide load, narrow mind. What can I say? No matter what these politicians say, the attacks on working people and collective bargaining they're not about state budget deficits. They're about deliberate political choices to take power away from working people and weaken unions. They are the political payback to industries and rich people who fund campaigns. Paybacks that have forced working people to shoulder the burden of the economic recovery, while people like the Koch brothers and the DeVos family profit from it. Now, a lot of those choices have been downright cruel, and some have actually been so extreme they seem almost fake. So we put together a quiz that we call Real or Not. So here's how it works. I'll tell you about a piece of legislation, and you say if it's real or not real, and I made it up. So here we go. A New England governor and Republican legislators proposed rolling back child labor laws so kids could work longer hours and get paid less. Real or not real? All right, you guys are pretty, you're on top of it. <laughs> it's real. Maine Governor Paul LePage signed a version of it into law, and Maine wasn't the only state to consider rolling back child labor laws this year, if you can believe that. So here's another. A Midwest senator proposed requiring foster children to use their whopping $70 a year clothing allowance only in thrift stores. Real or not real? Unbelievable, but it's real. That was Michigan's Bruce Caswell who said, I never had anything new. I got all hand-me-downs. 
Now, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. What happened to public servants, you know, serving their constituents, creating jobs, good paying jobs? And these state-based attacks on working people are part of a long-term agenda to take from those who have so little and give it to those who have so much. And state politicians aren't just after collective bargaining, are they? They're attacking education, construction workers, immigrants, voting rights. And on Capitol Hill, politicians want to destroy Medicare, shred education at every level, while doing nothing to grow the economy and help hardworking Americans. And guess what? The result? Raging inequality. America is creating more wealth than ever before, but most of us aren't seeing any of it. Almost all of it is going to the very richest, or should I say the luckiest, and not. Corporate profits are back, and last year the average CEO made over $11 million. That is enough to pay off the college debt of 473 grads, or to pay for 225 of those overpaid teachers that we keep hearing about. So what does that have to do with the attacks on collective bargaining and unions? Let's take a look at this chart. What happens when union membership falls? It's the red line you see. Look what happens to it. The middle class falls right with it. Collective bargaining, taking action together, is one of the best ways to remove those barriers to shared prosperity. Don't you all think it's tragic that so many politicians are willing to make life harder for women and children and young people and seniors and working families? It's as if they're trying to board up the doors to the middle class and not let low income workers in so that they don't make it in. So we talk about the problems and I've talked a lot about them already. Let's talk about the solution. Because together we can keep those doors open. And all across the country, people are joining together in new ways to make their voices heard. They're rising up. People in working class neighborhoods across the Midwest are joining the union family through the AFL-CIO's community affiliate, Working America. All right, they're in the house. By canvassing right on people's doorsteps, we are organizing people who don't have a union on the job in California. Immigrant car wash workers who are routine, routinely cheated on pay, harassed by their bosses, and exposed to toxic chemicals have come together to organize, and they've actually won lawsuits against their owners. Young workers, from teaching assistants to tech workers, are forming groups to stand up for themselves and for the rights of others. And domestic workers, like nannies and housekeepers, who don't even have the legal right to collective bargaining, are self-organizing. And those are the bright spots that give me hope. And I see these sparks all across America, but I see these bright spots across the globe as well. And I just got back from Geneva. Literally, I'm still six hours behind. <laughs> and I was a part of the most amazing thing. For the first time ever, the rights of domestic workers were recognized by international law. That's right. And as you all know, these are some of the most vulnerable workers. Not allowed, in some cases, to even leave the property. Not al allowed to wear gloves when they're cleaning toilets. They don't have a shift. They're actually on call 24 hours a day. And now they have the right to reasonable hours of work paid time off, and protection from discrimination and sexual abuse. They won a global workers, domestic workers bill of rights by coming together as an international alliance to demand their rights be acknowledged. So listen to these workers who were courageous enough to speak out. In isolation, a worker or a sector of workers has no power. 
we can only find power, you know, in numbers. And we can do that by joining associations, joining alliances. We can do that by uniting the working class uh, here in America and globally. So we need power. We cannot rely on legislations. We cannot rely on the Democrats or the Republicans or the corporations. There is an assault in, the, uh, in our right. There is an assault. Our wages continue to decrease. Our right continue to be in shrink. The only way that you're going to be able to exercise power, it will be through collective action. Now the AFL-CIO has just entered into new partnerships with the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the National Guest Workers Alliance because, as Linda just said in the video, no worker has power in isolation. We find power in numbers. We find power in community. And for low-wage workers excluded under our law, for people who freelance or work for themselves, that may include some of you, for young workers, high-tech workers, temporary contract workers, and the three million members of Working America, the only collective power they have is what they create themselves. And they're doing it, and it is so exciting. Because no individual worker, no single union, no one progressive activist or one single blogger alone can counter the entrenched, money-drenched, power of corporations and the wealthy. But together, we have a chance. And that's the one thing I hope I leave you with today, is together we actually have a chance. And that's why what we do makes a difference. Not we, just as in the AFL-CIO, but we as in you, the AFL-CIO, all our progressive partners and elected leaders who have the moral fiber to stand up against the tide and work for working people, we know the power of organizing. We see the hunger for it. Whenever we see that blue Wisconsin fist, we see the power in that simple phrase, we are one. And I'm grateful that we are one with the people of Netroots Nation. Thank you.